Welcome to another episode at Fisi Podcast. In this episode, I'm delighted to present you the guest of this episode. The first time I saw him was at the 8th Conference on Weaning and Rehabilitation in Critical Ill Patients in Belfast. And he gave a presentation on doing VR gaming in the intensive care unit. The second time I saw him, I found courage to actually ask him to join, to, to be a guest on this podcast. And happily, he was positive. And here we are. Today's guest is a leading international researching on intensive care and a practicing doctor. Welcome, Peter Spronk. It's an honor to have you on. <laughs> it's great to be here. Thank you, Frederick. For our listeners who aren't up to date about who you are and what you do, would you please give a short and brief introduction, like professionally and academically, who you are? <laughs> yeah, of course. That's a very important thing to mention first, because I'm Dutch. And so don't be confronted if I'm too direct or say things that are totally my responsibility and there is no things mentioned to be offensive <laughs> or, or what whatsoever, Frederick. So th I think that's important for the listeners to hear as, as, at first. But Very I'm, good. Roger I'm a, that. <laughs> I'm a full-time in intensivist. So I work as a consultant in the ICU in Apeldoorn in the Netherlands. That's a city of about 200,000 inhabitants. We have an ICU of uh, 14 beds without uh, cardiac surgery, no neurosurgery. So it's a mixed medical surgical ICU for adults. I've been working there now for more than 20 years. When I started, there were only two consultants who had to do all the work. And luckily, oh. there is now a team to help me out here because you get less young, so to say. <laughs> uh, so your shifts are getting more difficult over the years. But I became more and more interested over the years in the effects of critical illness on the quality of life and not only after ICU, but also in the ICU and things really have changed. So people that have been along longer in the ICU that are also listening to this podcast will know that maybe 15, 20 years ago, every person in the ICU was heavily sedated, mm -hmm. even on muscle relaxants sometimes and, and not awake. And that really has changed. So nowadays, Everybody is awake. That became also one of the incentives for me to dive into some research on what all the things that we do to people and with people in the ICU, what they actually mean to the patients and the families themselves, how we can change that and also hopefully change some quality of life thereafter. So we did a lot of projects over the years. I had some PhD students as well, acted also on international boards and uh, program committees in all kinds of conferences. And that's one of the reasons why Frederick and, and <laughs> I met. And of course, I was happy, was, I was very happy to contribute to this because this is something that is nowadays being done more often uh, using podcasts. Mm -hmm. While when I started, virtually the internet was, I was still in baby form. <laughs> so so there, that's where we are. Yeah, really. Okay. Actually, I did my bachelor's degree in physiotherapy in Netherlands as well. And what I realized is that the Dutch education system is incredibly focused towards innovation and technology. If you search, for example, Peter Spronk on ResearchGate, you'll see a lot of this focused uh, around technology. And if you li listen to one of Peter's speeches at the conference, you also uh, understand that you're all about the innovation. And why is innovation such an important aspect in healthcare? Just to start off with an open question like this. I think, Frederick, that's a very broad subject, innovation in medicine, because I, I think it, it would be good to be a little bit more uh, concise and, and focus on the uh, environment in the intensive care unit, because there are so many innovations that we could talk about. But I think that's what you mean. And um, I really think... Uh, there are tools now that will help us in, for instance, engaging patients in their rehab process. For instance, you have uh, bed cycles, but mm -hmm. it's very boring to be yeah. in a bed cycle. Yeah. Or it's just you put your cycles, so you're just pedaling along. And I have movies of patients actually pedal backwards. So they never get to their goal, uh, <laughs> but, but it's very, it's, so you have to have some motivation to go some somewhere. So one of the things that we now have included is 
is this little screen on top of the bed cycle so it actually moves like what in some fitness rooms as well mm -hmm. and you can make movies for instance in the environment of the place where where someone lives so if one That's paddles incredible. then through their own uh, village seeing even their own family members or their favorite cow next to the road then that will stimulate them and also engage them and it not only physically but also cognitively so i think these kind of innovations are important to to help us engage patients in embarking on a journey to get better and mm. it's hard work so you need motivation and these guys are this, this kind of stuff so this is just one of the aspects and so we did all the other stuff you you want other examples as well frederick or i think you uh, want i think it's it's a great example like uh, how just a small screen of actually uh, then to taking something you already have and just adding an aspect to it it's uh, i can imagine it's like meaningful as you say that you are cycling in your home environments you can get grounded into okay i am familiar with this place maybe you get some relief and i think like these small implementations are like what's innovation perhaps is all about doing like small steps towards a bigger goal and we are going to dive a bit deeper into what you talked about for example you did the presentation on gaming with vr headsets and if you can if you as a listener can imagine like a patient lying on the intensive care unit with a ventilator with a lot of different medical assistant devices and cables as such and then they are actually having these VR goggles and playing a game which kind of feels like a Minecraft looking game that are engaging them or that's pretty innovative and different from what on a day-to-day -day basis on an intensive care unit. Can you, and w when you do a project like this, if colleagues do a project like this, I, I think that uh, a lot of health, uh, our colleagues or healthcare professionals would be, would criticize and perhaps uh, give uh, feedback. And how can the researcher take this in a constructive manner when you are doing like projects that are provoking in a sense of way. Yeah, there are several things that come to mind when you mention VR goggles. There, there have been a lot of studies on that actually. Mm -hmm. And they're quite successful, for instance, in pain reduction, for instance, in patients with burns uh, who are, where the wounds are being uh, cared for. And the other thing is that, which is that if patients are also seeing stuff using VR goggles, that they suffer from less signs of depression. Mm -hmm. And also they can be prepared, for instance, for undergoing a surger surgical procedure or any other procedure, because beforehand they can li live through the experience already using goggles in a virtual environment. Ah, that's clever. So also preparing them for the ICU, for instance, for a scheduled large surgery, that could be useful. On the other hand, especially in elderly patients, sometimes you see that the goggles are actually causing dizziness, nausea, and even mm -hmm. sometimes also hallucinations. Because there are studies to prevent delirium, for instance, but in some patients it actually is inducing delirious sensations. So yeah. you have to be careful on which patients to use it in. Mm -hmm. And it's it's one of the reasons that we also play, play a lot with, with screens mm -hmm. so that people also can look away and are not submerged, as so to say, in another environment using VR goggles. I can uh, really relate to this cyber sickness, like being uh, nauseous using VR goggles. When I've been playing with them, I've really experienced this. But of course, you need some, you need to declare some communication and and uh, set some ground rules when you're using this kind of technology. I, I think, and I remember when you gave the speak about the VR project. Our discussion within the group at the conference was a lot oriented around the delirium part. And mm -hmm. if you, for example, read Vlake et al., Effect of Intensive Care Unit Specific Virtual Reality to Improve Psychological Wellbeing in ICU Survivors from 2023, you see that delirium is mentioned quite a few times. But actually, how do you, how do you know whether you 
it's like feasible for the patient or it's actually providing some positive effect for the patient to use this? It's If you look at pain reduction, then it could be very successful. And for instance, they're also do, now doing a study in, in Leuven, coordinated by Kate Hermans and Rick Hosling. And they, they have also, they are using goggles there as well in uh, mobilization. So oh. actually they have a goggle and then they um, have to move their hand. Uh, so their, their, the movement of their hands is actually projected in the virtual environment. So in that way, they're stimulated to catch several things. So in that way, you can uh -huh. use it as well in a virtual environment to get, you know, people to move their hand or their arms. I think that's a very smart addition to the system that we already have. And, and if we don't you go use goggles, we now have almost finished development of a game to mobilize patients that are still bedridden, where actually the movement is captured by video camera and then projected in uh, the screen. So okay. for instance, where you can move your feet and then playing pinball or raising a bridge, for instance, if you move your leg. Mm -hmm. So it's a combination of things and several techniques can be used in practice. Mm -hmm. So the question, the other question that you asked is um, how to convince others to embark on this journey because <laughs> you want to yeah. have an effect. It's not only playing around, right? So that's difficult because frequently all these studies are small case series. Mm -hmm. uh, what we're actually lacking is larger adequately powered uh, prospective studies uh, that are focusing on outcomes. And I think those are still on the horizon. One mm -hmm. of the problems here is that we are getting more and more innovations and the computers are getting faster and the techniques are improving, mm -hmm. but we are actually not having the, the evidence that it's actually uh, a good idea to do this. Maybe it's all playing around motivating people <laughs> yeah. and in itself it's nice but it's like with the bed cycle sue bernie did a very good study on mm. comparing the effect of using bed cycle in in bedridden patients and then uh, looked at outcomes and not only in the icu but also thereafter mm. and the effects were negative and there are also other trials that are that were negative mm. so it's frustrating that on the one hand things that make sense mm. if you really study them the effects are not that strong. So maybe those studies are partially under, but we still need more evidence. And so I'm a strong believer that it's a combination of things that on the one hand, that you stimulate your your, your physical status mm. and your muscles and maybe improve the, the time that your muscles are regaining their strength. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, you're also stimulating the brain and your cognitive status. And the last part is very difficult to evaluate actually, because you know people are different, brains are different. Norwegian Absolutely. people are are specifically different from Dutch people and from <laughs> US people. So yeah, so indeed, it's, it's very difficult to have some sort of standardized approach in evaluating mm. this. Uh, so it's complicated. We're getting there. I'm a strong believer that in engaging the patients and using new innovation, mm. the new innovative techniques in their rehab process will work. But when to do what? If yeah. a patient, for instance, is very weak, what takes precedence? Taking them out of bed, taking them off the ventilator, mm. playing games with, with the bed cycle, put the VR goggles on. When to do what in recovery yeah. and what's optimal? That's quite a challenge in any individual patient. Absolutely. And even though innovation is like a really important cornerstone of how we should do research in order to drive things forward, it's always difficult when you are doing inno innovation because you don't really have done this before, right? You don't have a lot of things to support. And as you mentioned earlier, when you get the results back and it's negative, it it, it still brings some value, but it, it's it, I can imagine it's tough to like get, get up on the horse and do another project and another project until you find like something that really brings the effect you, you would. If we are uh, talking about technology, what do you think uh, healthcare professionals should know about technology? I think it all starts with enthusiasm and some sort of drive to to innovate. So, for instance, in my example, I, I visited Johns Hopkins. Now, I think on 
almost 10 years ago. And I saw Michelle go with the Wii. So the yeah. Nintendo Wii. And I thought, this is a neat idea. So I went <laughs> home and I bought a fourth or fifth hand Wii somewhere, second hand. Yeah. And I just, I just started using it in the ICU. We had a special screen and we just wheeled it around. And we just found out and see whether patients would like it or not. And mm -hmm. actually, we built from that. So it was only 20 euros or something. It doesn't matter. Oh, yeah. uh, but it's just that you are, you have to have some people around that are enthusiastic and are mm -hmm. local champions and actually are going to use it in practice and are not mm -hmm. afraid to do that. So that's the first, I think, foremost important thing. The second mm -hmm. thing is that you have to be aware of uh, safety issues. So if you are going to use new technology, then you really have to test especially in an ICU environment, whether there are no currents that are leaking or that mm. it's causing any disturbance of the other signals. So you have to do a lot of safety tests mm. beforehand before or you actually can embark on studies or in, in uh, let's say, a routine application in the ICU. And for instance, there are also practical issues. For instance, we have now this game that I talked about on the combination of a screen with a video capture analysis. Yes. So obviously, as you can understand, there are so many cables and other equipment mm. around the bed. So it's very difficult for the, in the video image analysis to actually capture the movement in itself oh, yeah. and not other things that are going to move oh, as well. So, so there are a lot of technical and practical issues as well mm. so we definitely should do that together with developing companies give them feedback on this does work this does not work and this is the reason why mm. so there are a lot of uh, barriers to to get over and uh, and it's, it but it's still it's a lot of fun to to try to be innovative to create something mm. new and patients like it that's also a very important thing because they are Absolutely. so bored if you are going to lie in an ICU bed and you look mm. to the ceiling and, and you're just counting the tiles and the, and the lamps, it's really terrible. If you cannot move, yeah. you cannot communicate. If it's it, sometimes you're in pain, distress, you're itching, you're obviously thirsty and you cannot do anything. So it's very important to, to get them on board. So whatever you do, they will like it. Absolutely. And now like a progressing towards talking about like how to do this in practice, like how, how would you actually do it uh, on the intensive care unit? And as you also mentioned earlier, there's a, a lot of evaluations going on. Should we take uh, the patient off the ventilator? Should we start doing uh, more frequent mobilization, more rehabilitation? How do we play the cards best in order to get this patient well? And it's pretty certain to me that in the future, technology is going to play a, a large role in how we manage patients. How do you think technology impact current prax praxis and decision-making uh, early rehabilitation in the I ICU? That's a very broad and difficult question because it also depends on local logistics, the situation, the case mix, but also on the availability of equipment and personnel. And particularly the latter is, is important. Peter Nidal from Kiel in Germany has done a lot of work on this. Mm -hmm. And we know that uh, there is a huge lack of physiotherapists in ICU. Most frequently in hospitals, physiotherapists are working in a regular wards, but also on the side in the ICU. And it's uh, only in very large ICUs where they have dedicated PTs uh, actually working in the ICU themselves. So mm -hmm. uh, frequently the nurses are doing the mobilization, for instance. And I mentioned this because mm. not only the combination of physios and the lack of thereof and ICU nurses, but frequently also, for instance, occupational therapists are not uni universally present. And the combination of that team is frequently needed to, to use also the technolo technology Absolutely. besides getting out of bed, getting off the edge of the bed, standing, maybe uh, small steps walking, etc. But if you're going to use equipment as well, you have to be trained in in the equipment in itself, but also, for instance, how to store the data for later analysis and comparison. If you do it, for instance, one, one week later and mm -hmm. see whether there was any improvement or not. So it's I think it's depending a lot on local 
possibilities. And one of the problems as well is if you have a lot of acute admissions, for instance, the patients that need the early mobilization most, those are the elderly patients that are frail, uh, that yes. have ICO quite, quite weakness, that need actually the mobilization. But if there's an acute admission, everybody runs to the acute admission to save a life, which mm -hmm. is logical in an ICU because that's why you're for. <laughs> but it's but then the because it should be uh, you can be in on two places at the same time as a team and you have to focus. So that's why especially mobilization in itself is actually lacking in the patients that need them most. There are a lot of studies on that that we're actually not delivering the the care that we should particularly mm. regarding mobilization, but also then on top of that, you yes. are now talking about innovations and putting new technology in there as well on top of that. Yep. So let's say we first have to do the normal things right. So in that respect, a lot of the innovations are still, let's say, the domain of people that are enthusiastic uh, researchers in the field and are innovators. Let's say there are the zealots in this field, uh, but there are so many people that you have to tag along. And so that's one of the reasons that I really ha was happy uh, to talk to you in this podcast, because mm -hmm. I think more and more people should know that we have to do the normal things, but that's, even that's not enough. So we have to do more, but it's difficult to do that if you're lacking the personnel to actually deliver. So that's, that's a message that we have to get across to hospital administrators, et cetera. So to improve our quality of care. Absolutely. And as you mentioned, introduction wise, you said that all the patients, when you started working in the ICU, all the patients were heavily sedated and there's been a progress. So something is like going on to a change how we practice in the ICU. And mm -hmm. it's a hot topic these days about how to humanize the patient experience. Like in the ICU, where the patient could be prone to lose certain human aspects of their living being just because they are in a environment that are threatening to them. There's so many different people bedside talking over their heads. It's so much equipment. Do you think like more technology is actually dehumanizing the patients more? Or do you have any thoughts and reflections upon that? That's a very important question that you're asking, Frederick, regarding humanization of the ICU environment. Actually, this whole concept got me interested in this field because mm -hmm. one of my PhD students is Jose Hofhuis. She mm -hmm. wrote a very interesting article, I think around 2000, on oh, patient yeah? experiences in the ICU. And there are quotes like, I'm not a machine that needs to be fixed. I'm a human being too. Mm -hmm. So there, it's very important. And obviously any good physician or nurse knows this, mm -hmm. that we should talk with the patient, not to the patient or about the patient. Mm -hmm. That is totally different things. So in that respect, if you keep that in mind, then the technology actually is not a, is not a, a barrier or a hurdle. But it's just one of the tools in your toolbox that you can use. But still, you have to place the patient and the family central. If that would be the starting point of mm -hmm. your treatment process, then you could just introduce a tool. Mm -hmm. For instance, what we have, I showed this at the conference as well, this tool where we show a screen and we put a sensor beneath the chin and mm -hmm. the patients can swallow to train swallowing to treat dysphagia in the ICU. Yes, kangaroo hopping on the screen and the harder you swallow, the higher the kangaroo hops. <laughs> yeah. and, and in that way, it's very stimulating. So, but the starting point is that the patient actually has swallowing problems, Yes, uh, is not enjoying the food. So from that starting point, you can introduce something new and novel as an innovation. We could try this and this, we, we developed that. Mm -hmm. What do you think? And then, so there is a direct communication with the patient and in that way, it's not a hurdle or a barrier that you introduce more innovative things, mm. but it's, an, it's a focused way of introducing it. Because sometimes if a patient has no swallowing problems, I'm not going to introduce the kangaroo, although yeah. it might be fun. Yeah. Then we have to think about something else. So we, then we can work the problem on the one hand mm -hmm. from a medical point of view. But on the other hand, the patient is still the one with the problem. 
Yes. And we could be the start in the in the rehab process. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does completely make sense. And I like your positivism around uh, using technology because I phrased the question like, are we taking us longer uh, apart from the patient when we're using technology? But actually you, you found this example that brought my thoughts the other way again. In general terms, how can, what should we focus on to actually humanize the patients in the ICU? What you have a 20 year of experience working there. What's your take on this? Yeah, you could think uh, about a lot of things. Some ICUs also use colors and lighting in their ICU. We, for instance, very simple things probably is also present in your ICU. Just put a sign up. I am. Let's say Mr. Johnson, yes. uh, my dog is called X and Y. I'm yeah. very proud of the dog. And then the picture of the dog, <laughs> my hobbies are, I play an instrument. I like mm -hmm. music. So then you get some sort of, you enter the room, mm -hmm. you see this man, but you're also getting a little bit of an idea of, uh, what this man is as a person, as mm. a human being. And in that way, the communications with the patient also will be more easy on a more personal level. So that will also be a way of humanizing the environment because of the communication aspects. Mm -hmm. You are obviously in trouble regarding photographs. We have been playing around with that as well. Yeah. For instance, we, I live in a central part of the Netherlands mm -hmm. where there's a lot of dunes and moors. Mm -hmm. And we have some pictures of that and mm -hmm. they're beautiful. But there were patients actually that had survived the Second World War yeah. And we're actually seeing this. They thought there were Germans able, being able to shoot them oh behind it. So sometimes things happen that you didn't think about that are actually causing trouble in patients. So the only thing to address that is just ask, think about it. And things are, from a patient's perspective, always different mm -hmm. than what we as good, willing care providers think that will happen. Never assume. The assumption is the mm -hmm. mother of for what? Oh yeah. And, and that also is present in the ICU. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> but very nice. I, I, when I walk into the ICU here at the Rikshospital in Norway, we oftentimes do have a lot of pictures of the family hanging yeah. on the walls. There's yeah. uh, probably a plan of what uh, the day consists of, what they're dealing with uh, from day to day. But actually this, I, I like this detail about something personal, something written that so you can connect on, okay, this person might like to talk about this instrument or whatever yeah we have we have now a, a man has been in the unit now for four months yeah. and he really likes cars <laughs> so he has a lot of pictures in his room of all different cars so if you know you can embark and ask questions and then you see his eyes light up oh, yeah and he really he awakes yeah. so it's going to sparkle oh. it's, it's really great so it's I think that's the most important point that you mm. just see the person in the bed as a human being also connect with it. So the human, so you cannot, let's say, supply, replace that mm. with an environment because True. the human interaction is the most important part regarding in, in that respect, from my mm. point of view. I totally agree. For a last question. So what can healthcare professionals working with outpatients learn from how we manage the uh, patients in the intensive care unit? Uh, you you mean, for instance, general practitioners or? Yeah, or for, let's see, say in the context of rehabilitation, because a lot of our listeners are working either as physiotherapists or osteopaths or physiotherapists or uh, chiropractors or something mm -hmm. in, in like these genres. Do you, do you have any ideas? At least many times, I think we push the patients a lot harder in the ICU than we would push an outpatient. Like, for example, an office worker coming to a clinic with some kind of pain in the arm, for example. And sometimes we prescribe this office worker patient with actually we suggest them to rest in order to get better. But in the ICU, we see the completely different thing. And the context is, of course, there the patient is fighting for their life or at least uh, the quality of their life. And we feed onto that and we push the patients really hard and train them just to an extent that I think we should emphasize that we should not be scared to actually load the patients when we see how we actually are loading the patients in the ICU. Yeah. 
Yeah, okay. That is also a very important issue because you're touching on exercise physiology, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's also what I mentioned before that we have to choose. Uh, you mentioned that in your ICU, there is a sort of daily program of what the patient is supposed to do. For instance, mm -hmm. getting out of bed, weaning out a ventilator, talking, uh, meeting family members, etc. So you try to balance this out because there is also a resting phase, like in sports medicine. We mm -hmm. know that we do sports and then maybe you have some energy drinks or some protein and then you're going to rest and then yes. etc. And that's also something that we want to do. You have want them to regain their muscle Mm -hmm. mass but also their muscle function mm -hmm. so it should be balanced to for instance the input of dietitians what we do every week in the icu in the long stay patients is we do uh, a nitrogen balance uh, mm -hmm. to, to see whether their protein intake is, is enough mm -hmm. but also whether their uh, water calorie direct calorimetry whether also the, your calorie intake is enough balanced on your on the the exercises that you do help with the physiotherapist and it's difficult. We don't know whether, for instance, bolus feeding or continuous feeding is better mm -hmm. when you're related to mobilization. Mm -hmm. Zulim Puducherry is doing some studies on that in the UK. Mm -hmm. So we still have to find out. But if you translate it to the wards, that's an important point as well, because in the ICU, there's a team that's taking care of the patient and obviously want to treat the patient. But one of the reasons is also to get them out of the ICU because there are a lot, lot of waiting people that need to be need to get in, right? Yeah. But then they drop in a huge hole because there will be discontinuity in the intensity of care mm. from a physiotherapy point of view, but also dietitians, uh, SLPs, and also other cares. Mm. So the continuity of the care is a problem. And we really should think about it, whether the patient actually is able to go to the ward or that we should keep them in the ICU or that there should be a plan getting them out of the ICU. Uh, so that's the first step. And the second step would be to get them out of the hospital ward mm -hmm. to a rehab center or even to a home. And then again, there should be some sort of, you should, you have to know what the balance is between mm -hmm. the loading of the patient, as you say, and the capacity. So that's one thing. The other oh. thing that I'd like to say is also regarding the care in in the rehab centers and after hospital discharge is that there are particular entities in especially long stay ICU patients like neuropathies, but also mm -hmm. extra osseal calcifications mm -hmm. that can be very painful. It can be treated, but have to be recognized. Oh, so yeah. sometimes people have to be, if there's an unexplained problem or there is no progression, mm -hmm. there could be a continuity or a recurrence of the problem uh, while they why they were in the ICU in the first place. So maybe then consult or send them to an art clinic that uh, should be re-evaluated. I think that could be one of the, the issues that should be considered after hospital uh, discharge. I think it's just so wise word to, towards the end of this podcast episode. I really agree upon the how we should balance each professional, everybody in the intensive care unit or in the hospital or really in the healthcare industry are there for their patients and do really want to offer the best care they can. And if everyone is doing all they can at once, it's just a mess. We have to plan. We have to take time to the nutrition. We have to take time to the rehabilitation exercise. We do have to have time to rest and digest. Completely agree with your steps. And yeah, we usually do uh, make a blog post at fisi.no uh, where it's a description of the episode and some resources connected for connected to the page for the listeners who wants to learn more about what we talked today. Talk about today and we talked about innovation and technology and a bit of how we manage patients in the icu do you have something on top of your head right now that you think we should put it on there i can at least put on a uh, vlog at all with the vr article and oh, you also mentioned this so you had this phd candidate in around 2000 which seemed like a good read for getting a feeling of what humanizing patients is all about mm -hmm. yeah I'll, i will i will send you some information uh, frederick and you can put it on the website uh, because out of my head i think it's better to have the correct references uh, but there are several things that that could be considered 
yeah it, it's very nice to talk about this that's very nice are are you attending the uh, ninth conference on winning uh, rehabilitation and critical ill patients in norway I'm supposed to to go there, yes, okay. because I, I've been talking a lot with Christian about this. I really hope to be there, and maybe a lot of the listeners will be there too. So maybe I also should suggest that if they don't go, they have to send you an email and explain why they didn't go. <laughs> yeah, I agree on that. <laughs> I, think this is a, I think this is an excellent meeting, the Early Rehab and Winning Conference, because it's multidisciplinary. And in that respect, it's special because there's physios, there are SLPs, there are also dietitians and uh, winning specialists because of the multidisciplinary nature of the meeting, especially of non-physicians. There will be physicians there, but it's predominantly also the people that actually do the work. So that's a great thing. <laughs> that's a very good thing. Okay, I hope you. I hope I will see you there and you listeners there at the conference in Norway. And thank you so much for your time, Peter. I know you're a busy doctor, but it was so pleasant to talk to you, and I'm just happy we could do this. Yeah, oh, always a pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me, Frederick. Have a nice very day. Very good. Have a nice day. <laughs>